Kevin Marklow studied architecture and art history in the United States from 1983 to 1991. Working alone since, Small Projects was born in 2002. He lives, writes, designs, and teaches primarily in Malaysia, the country where his architectural work originates. Engaged in the search for questions regarding things we believe we already have answers for, his work is plural in outcome, focused on addressing necessity, relevance, and the specificity of context in the process of design. With each project, with each project undertaken, big or small, he's interested in how elements and issues, both large and small, only ever find meaning in the intimate junctions where they meet, and how the big picture is less about finding radical solutions than a radical way of framing questions. His work on office buildings, houses, master plans, and mailboxes, cemeteries, park toilets, low-cost housing and furniture have been published in the book, Small Projects, distributed internationally and in architectural journals in Europe, Asia, and Oceania. I'd like to invite him on stage for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fatih, who is uh, responsible for making sure that uh, Sajad, uh, Sa Sa Sajad and myself come to and from the conference every day, brought me, uh, treated me to something special yesterday. He brought me to, um, to see the uh, Empress Market and the uh, uh, Zainab Markets. And um, I don't know when the last time it was you've been to the Empress Market, but it is mind-blowing. It's, it's this courtyard. It's got a lot of like... Well, the only really made in Pakistan things I found were from there, two glasses and uh, wooden spatulas, and it was fantastic. But the amazing thing is that courtyard opens out to the meat area, the area where they sell spices, meats, uh, pickles, and then the vegetables on the side. The Zainab market I, 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 I was amazed by because it reminded me of another market I saw um, about a month ago in, in Bombay. I don't know if you guys been to the Mangal Das cloth market. It, I mean, aside from architecture and food, I really love cloth, yeah, but the Mangal Das cloth market is one of the most amazing things ever you'd ever see because it's just crammed full of people and stuff. The corridors are barely six feet wide, but after everything spills out onto the corridors, it's just enough space to walk through, passing someone else with three bags of cloth each. The, these kiosks and booths are stacked up one upon the other over a height of about three stories, and this massive roof covers them with like ventilation right in the middle, uh, skylights so that you can see away in the daytime. It, it's, and and, and there, are, uh, there are so many traders there 50,000 people walk through that every day. And, and the amazing thing about this market, it's not designed by any architect, but it answers one amazing question. How do you cram as many traders into a single space as possible while allowing all the grace of natural ventilation, running water, they're all on the west, uh, east side, you know, and no, no toilets are found anywhere else. Um, into a space which ventilates well, has got all the grace of circulation, and is easy to make your way all around. And it seems today, you know, with all the assignments we get in school, with the commissions we get from projects and, and clients, that we, 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 we become so preoccupied with looking for answers, we forget that the assignment can't start without a question or a problem to solve. You know, there's this book written by Doug Adams, I don't know if you've read it, it's called A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, you know, in part of that story, it's got to do with the fact that humanity wants it, the answer to all of life, love, uh, uh, science, and everything. And so they fed this uh, request into the computer, supercomputer. It worked over 7 million years, and out came the answer. It was 42. And, you know, we, there are a lot of 42s floating around in the world today. And it seems as though to me that the best of architecture, and you know what? I forgot my pointer, so I'm going to have to run over there to get it. <laughs> no, it's my changer too, sorry. No, it's my fault. I completely forgot when I ran up the stage. Ta -da. So I, I've discovered that, you know, the most powerful architecture always begins with a relevant question. And every time you ask yourself a deeper question about what it is, you peel another layer of the onion. Architecture is this onion, the layers of which you peel one by one. The most commercial work in the world barely peel at the 
skin of the onion. It's not even a layer. You know, it's uh, about being famous, about being globally known, about doing work that earns you a hell of a lot of money and new commissions. That's just the skin of the onion. The first layer is something that... Can we, can we get rid of these lights? This is really disturbing, sorry. Um, the next layer would, would have to do with things like climate, uh, uh, stuff that Kenneth Frampton and Alex Zonis called uh, uh, critical regionalism, which were really formal um, 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 deliberations on uh, climate and, uh, and, uh, and environment and, 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 and certain degree of culture, but mostly symbolic and formal in nature. It, it has to do with the tree next door, uh, the high-rise uh, story building right there, where east is, where west is, and that's kind of like the, the, the first layer of the onion. The other two layers get, in, get a lot more complicated in a way, and that's what I'd like to talk about a bit today. But really, the whole issue of architecture has got to do with how many questions and how deep we want to go down the proverbial rabbit hole. How, how, how far you want to chase that white rabbit. <clears throat> For the general context of Malaysia, that first layer of the onion, we live in a very, very comfortable uh, um, climate zone, really. We don't have any earthquakes or typhoons. We, we just have a ton of rain during certain time, twice a year, during the uh, westerlies and the monsoons. And we have a tremendous rate of, uh, of uh, we have a, a lot of sunshine, which results in the combination of those two result in a tremendous rates of growth and decay. Things uh, grow uh, and die as fast as you can say, um, give me something more. Um, I, I often tell uh, my, my, my audiences that you won't find more biodiversity in a single square foot of land in, in Malaysia in, uh, than in anywhere else in the world. You, know, you could cough up some phlegm on a sidewalk and have something grow out of it after three days. Um, and that's kind of like the, the general context of Malaysia. The, the second layer of the onion has got to do with something I call specific context. Now, specific context is, is that stuff with barriers. It's, as an example, it's about the fact that you have got, you know, um, the rain trees in Singapore have got this green, uh, oh, sorry, this orange lichen growing on them, whereas in Malaysia, with just one degree of latitude separating them, our lichen is like green. It's got to do with the fact that um, rainwater is collected to a totally different effect in Jakarta as it is in Beijing. In Beijing, the rainwater is used for as water catchment areas and huge uh, canals that run, uh, radiate out of the city. Um, it's got to do with the fact that um, your, your urinals, in, in men's urinals in Pakistan, are, are so high, you almost have to stand on tiptoe or, you know. But, but Pakistanis have longer legs, so I guess that's what, you know, makes it so specific to Pakistan. Um, the specific context of Malaysia, aside from, you know, the stuff that would take two, a whole book to get through, uh, has got to do with something I call building culture. Our building culture is, is a mess. We've got concrete that looks like crap, that's cast really badly, it's all honeycombing, but it, it does not affect the structural integrity of our buildings at all. Things don't fall down that much. So it's ugly, but it works. We've got brickwork that, that, that's so awful that we usually use a whole layer of uh, max factor to, to hide it all you know, behind with paint. Uh, we've got great carpenters, most of them most of whom come from Indonesia, they're boat builders, so carpentry and timber work is fantastic. We've got fantastic welding uh, uh, welders who, who are able to do works that sometimes Europeans mistake having come from Germany. And we've got this thing called, uh, well, you know, the ecology, which kind of like manifests itself on the man-made at, at the rates of growth and decay I mentioned earlier, that's just phenomenal. So it's that combination of all of this that Adds, up, uh, adds to what I call its formal building culture. The next layer of the onion, the third layer, is something that uh, is a theory I have about the world, architecture being a small part of, that, that are divided into formal and informal systems. Now, formal systems are everything that has a name. And this third layer and the layers thereafter have everything to do with questions regarding this theory I have. Now, let me try to explain that. So, Formal systems are everything, are, some, are things that we all share. It's everything that has a name. It, it refers to governments, banks, uh, public toilets, uh, bus systems. Everything which has a name will uh, will be categorized as a formal system. So, 
And I found out in, in researching it that formal systems generally are made up of these four items. Composure, because you obviously need a certain degree of, of that in order to recognize it as a formal system. Sanitization, so that that formal system is maintained and that it works from day to day and year to year. Exactitude, so that, um, the, that there's less uh, maintenance or sanitization that goes along with that formal system. And iconization. After a while, it doesn't matter whether you know what that formal system was for, you follow the darn thing. Informal systems are often looked at in the world as dilutions of formal systems. So what happens is, when, say, the judiciary gets corrupt, we think that's an informal system. When traffic buggers up in uh, Jakarta, we think that's an informal system. When you've got huge barriers placed around public buildings in Pakistan, in Karachi, we think that's an informal system. That's not true. Informal systems are everything that we don't have names for. It's got to do, it's, it's a strange thing. It's like, uh, as an example, it's got to do with the fact that regardless of where you are in the world, the dinner table, the dining table, food, is, what, is that one activity that draws the whole family together. It's another example is when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is not look at your toes, you either look up the ceiling or at the side of your, uh, of your bed. So putting a, a beautiful view at the foot of the bed is kind of a silly thing. It's also got to do with, if you're driving, if you're used to driving fast cars like, you know, my two friends, Fateh and Daud, are used to. <laughs> Between, in, in a narrow street with cars flanking it, the best way to get through is not to look at what you want to avoid because you'll just hit it. It's to look at the space in between. These have, things have no names. It's what makes us human. And these formal informal systems are what interest me. So informal systems, as opposed to being dilutions of formal systems, let's pull that aside, are actually their own thing. And the kicker is this, that whenever you need, whenever you want, you want to see change in the world, whenever change happens by evolution or by intent, it's because something happens with the informal system. It's because specific context asks a question of that informal system which then becomes formalized and then runs that whole process of a formal system. And I found in architecture that that combination results in um, a, a series of four different ideas, composure, the opposite of, or the informal part bit of which is animation, sanitization, accretion, exactitude, accommodation, and iconization narrative. And, and that's what I'm going to go through now in a bit of an embarrassing way. This is where the boring bit might start because it's going to be about my work. <laughs> And hopefully, you know, I'll try to make it a bit more interesting. So let's talk about these uh, as we go along. Let's, um, and one other thing I want to say is iconization, because the icon is about form, it's generally formally induced, and narrative that, that starts from issues of content. So I'm just going to, you know, uh, abbreviate those two there because it, it bears reference to what I'm going to plow through in the end. So let's just start with composure and animation. Now, what's that all about? Composure architecturally refers to the fact that we, we, we contain stuff, whether it's air in ceilings or, 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 or double glazing or, 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 or spaces within our buildings. It's all about stopping movement of, of air because in, in temperate countries, which is where most formal systems have grown, you don't want that air moving around because you know, uh, um, the mo moving air is the first thing that's going to create cold or uh, a heat gain. So in place of that, what I have is... Um, Summarized here as a concept is a, is a picture of the uh, Series 3 Land Rover which it's with its safari roof. What happens is whatever air, hot air gets trapped between that, that um, sunbreak and the body of the car itself just gets flushed out when the car moves or when the wind blows. So it's all about moving stuff, moving air. It's about decomposure or decompartmentalization. And I'm going to run through some projects by way of that. This is a safari roof house where instead of putting glass between the body of the house and the roof, I've just left it as an empty space, a clear space for winds to breeze right all the way through. So any hot air just hits carried out the same way it gets done in the Land Rover vehicle you saw earlier. Um, the spaces I create uh, uh, have uh, lack, lack that differentiation between in and out. I try to create a lot of ambiguity, so um, there's a lot of uh, uh, com uh, contact and a lot of cross ventilation between the ins inside and the out. Um, handrails are not seen as, as a means to stop things, uh, movement from happening, but uh, are created in a way of um, 
like a stocking handrail so that it gets a bit more sexy walking upstairs and as well as allows wind to pass through. And that also applies to um, hand railings where um, of, in a high rise, the, the, the louvers, which are aftermarket you know, radiator grills, get placed in a way that they allow views down to the courtyard below, but from above, they block the sun's rays until the later part of the day, uh, about 4.30 to 5 o'clock, when the sun's already pretty cool by then. That movement of air also has to do with the way I design um, um, uh, seating for lobbies of houses, uh, perforated so that you, know, you don't burn your ass and, and your pants don't balloon if you were to fart. Um, uh, also, by way of, um, of, uh, of uh, entry mats to house lobbies, this one for the uh, louver box house where I've got a, um, a grating instead of a doormat so that you just kick off your dirt from your shoes. It falls down to a gravel bit below which gets, just gets washed away. And, and the traces of human inhabitation inside change from day to day depending on whose footwear is on the doormat itself. Um, this whole issue of, of the movement of air sometimes uh, gives rise to a, a different way of viewing how uh, spaces relate to each other. In the tr threshold house, I've got a, a walk-in wardrobe. Well, the walk-in wardrobe is part of the bedroom, but that opens totally out to the, uh, to the, uh, um, the um, bathroom itself, and, and that itself is very open, so there's a constant flow of wind all the way through. Um, in larger projects, that, that uh, 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 idea of moving air translates also to getting rid of uh, compartment, sorry, of compartmentalized fire stairs to avoid the whole need for pressurization. Uh, and instead, I've got these smoking balconies. You run out of the office, um, out, out of these balconies, which themselves are, are ventilated from, from below, um, out into, back into naturally ventilated uh, um, vertical circulation cores, which, um, which don't require pressurization as well. Um, I've also got uh, this whole issue of uh, moving air and, and, and transparency also makes uh, reference to services uh, where I've got you know, junction boxes placed place behind the same kind of a mesh in, in, in uh, domestic architecture as well as in my larger projects which just make it easier for subcontractors to install and to maintain the, the, the whole idea of having services um, kind of like sexually hidden behind you know, um, stockings. Um, and the idea of animation also applies to how the, the large uh, uh, fenestration which allows uh, um, cross ventilation and, and more movement of air are all on, the, on themselves given expression by means of the detail um, that, that, that express that whole animate quality that they uh, also open themselves up to. The next um, issue has to do with uh, that of sanitization and accretion. Now sanitization has to do with um, there was a lecture I, I, I did in Boston about two years ago wh which had to do with the global architect in the free trade era. And that the subtext of that had to do with the fact that there's a whole lot of ubiquity, sameness happening in architecture around the world. And, and in order to find out whether that was true, true, true I, I thought I had to research this. And I found out that it was not true at all. There was more variety in the world than ever before. And then I came across three slides that kind of blew me away, that, that kind of linked them all. They were uh, slides of the World Trade Center and, and the Twin Towers in New York before they came down, the Burj Al Khalifa and the Petronas Twin Towers in Malaysia. And I found out what they had in common, what made them ubiquitous was the fact that they all cleaned in the same way. <laughs> and throughout the world, um, it doesn't matter whether you're Sir Norman Foster or, or Zaha Hadid, Buildings don't give, aren't given this, this, this um, you know why? Because it's going to be cleaned by some migrant labor anyway, you know, from some Afghanistan or, you know, <laughs> Bangladesh and in Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, and, and it's just this lack of respect given human dignity, which is, I think, a bit of a problem. So in, in lieu of sanitization, the constant cleaning and, and, and maintenance of our buildings, I've got to do with, uh, you just kind of like garden them. So the garden hedge. And let me give you some examples. Um, it's got to do not just with how we make our buildings, our concrete, gravel, cement, but what grows on them and the manner in which we allow accretion to happen in a way which um, adds to the aesthetics of the building instead of takes away from it. And, and it's got to do with the fact that you don't need a, an elevation to a house to, to uh, announce entry. Sometimes the shade of a tree is good enough for that. It's just, a, 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 seems to me, a slightly more... Um, human, uh, uh, a gracious way of, of saying hello 
uh, um, elevations looking out the golf course. You don't have to have a building elevation. Maybe just a clear-cut line of trees is enough of a window for that building to, to state its presence. In, uh, oops. In larger, oh yeah, and inside the buildings itself, the whole idea of accretion of uh, trees taking over a courtyard, acting as a cooling sink instead of having a totally open courtyard with, with paving, uh, allowing heating to happen, uh, um, seems to be you know, a, a pretty decent idea to deal with courtyard spaces. In larger projects as well, um, the, old, the idea of the forest uh, a courtyard uh, takes um, precedence over a formal courtyard, which is just hard paved so that um, cooling happens uh, passively. And then in very large projects, uh, sometimes courtyards become the whole means of welcoming people in. In, in, in Malaysia, in Chinese uh, architecture, there's this called, thing called feng shui. I think you are familiar with that. In India, it's called, um, what's it called in India? Vastu, thank you. And, and um, in feng shui, you're not allowed to put trees in front of your buildings. In, in this uh, building, I've got about uh, a, a thousand trees uh, in front of the main entrances. And what that does is it, it provides shade in, in, the, in the later part of the evening into the lobbies itself, which serve as the living rooms for the uh, office building. And um, to be ventilated, or you can't see it in there, or there, sorry. But there are vents up there which allow that movement, that animate movement of air once again. Um, but animation is not just stuff which happens on uh, architecture, it's also stuff which um, happens on surfaces of, of the buildings. And so I try to take all of those cues into account when, with the way I build, whether it's in, in uh, ficus uh, uh, um, trees that actually take over the walls or, or garden steps and, 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 um, and paving uh, uh, patterns. And such that the, the, the accretion that happens on the surfaces become part of the architecture itself, leading to that whole act of, you know, gardening instead of cleaning and washing and repainting and recladding. Um, in, in small projects as well as large projects, I try to pay more attention to materials which allow that whole act of accretion to happen with a bit more grace and dignity. Um, and then there's, thing, there's this thing I call caking, where th there's so much stuff happening on the building, it, it begins to cake it and the architecture begins to disappear. And the nice thing about that is not only do you not have to worry about cleaning and maintaining that building, you also don't have to worry about it overheating during the really warm days of, of the year caking right there. And um, in the garden shed shed, I wanted a garden shed that felt like a garden shed from the outside in or from the inside out. So the, the roof of that was made out of glass and the amount of light that's inside is just controlled by how often you want to uh, sweep out the dead leaves or, or trim the, the roof. And, and then there's this mad science of, you know, creating a transparent roof in the tropics. This is the, um, as the uh, uh, green splice house. And, and it started as a project for a client who wanted something completely different. And he didn't have a program. He just said, I want two rooms. Uh, give me a lovely living room, dining room. It's where I want to spend uh, unusual times with my family. And the whole idea for this project to, you know, to display the mad, its mad science came about from, the, from looking at how terrace houses are, are, are designed in, in Malaysia. They're generally you know, lots that are about range from between 20 feet to 25 feet wide. And, and between 75 to uh, 90, 90 feet deep. And what happens is, you usually have just two ends of the house which you know, have openings. One small end over here, because this other end faces a garage. And the back alley, which is kind of dirty and a bit smelly anyway too. And, and what, what the house did, uh, I, I, what I did for the house was, I cleared out half of it and tilted that half into, the, uh, the, the, into a two-story volume over there. And then I strung a whole garden right through that, which allowed for cross-ventilating right through the house, as well as from the rooms, because there are some openings on the side which allow cross-ventilation to happen through rooms as well, and uh, which allowed views all the way through from one end of the house to the next, living room and dining room, as well as uh, um, protected your views from the bedroom out to you know, your own formal garden, which looks down into the living room, dining room, and kitchen. Now, the trouble is, you can plant all these trees in there, but they're not going to grow if you put a roof over it, which is what you need if you want to use it as your living room, dining room, kitchen. So I realized in order for these trees to grow properly, I needed to put a transparent roof on it. So that's what I did. And, but before that project happened, another project came online in Singapore, which was called the, the, um, the brick, uh, God, the barnstorm house. And, and it had a really ugly neighbor on the side. And so I, I basically did the, essentially the same kind of concept on it. I pulled out half of the house, tilted it up, 
to a three-story volume, and all those rooms look down into the kind of more restrained version of that garden I was talking about, which runs through the living room, dining room, and kitchen. So that's what it looks like from across the way with the trees growing in there. Just just uh, one line of skylights which allow light in through so the trees can grow. And um, that's a view of the dining room looking out to the living room, kitchen on the side. The bedrooms all look down into the layer of the living room right there. In the meantime, the, the, the Green Splice house came back online and that whole explosion of, of trees from the inside of the house to outside, the transparent roof and all that light that spilled in which allowed the trees to grow or to give shade to the spaces below so that it's equivalent of sitting under a shaded tree where the, the sunlight doesn't make and the heat doesn't make such of a, a great degree of a, of a gain and difference in the end. That's a view of the living room, dining room and the kitchen at the end with the trees inside the house. The next um, it, uh, topic I'd like to talk about has got to do with exactitude and accommodation. Now, what this has to do with is um, the fact that what we've adopted you know, from, 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 um, from developed countries is the fact that everything is exact. You know, from the way uh, handrails are joined to tap wear and how beautifully chromed and polished it is, right up to seeing things you can't even see, like you know, Mercedes Benz. I mean, you know, that's why maybe we have such ugly buildings in our country, in Malaysia, because you know, it takes a lot of uh, energy to do that kind of stuff with cladding, right? And, and, and the, the polish that goes on with, with comp composure. What I tried to do, is I try to leave things uh, as traces of the way people just normally build in the country anyway and try to contrast it with something which is a little bit more finished which doesn't take the kind of effort, tremendous effort that you would need otherwise. And uh, examples, um, materials are, are left very much in a raw finish with uh, paint wherever it's needed on existing floors. Um, living dining rooms sometimes are just left with with bricks completely ungrouted so that um, whatever gets spilled on the floor over dinner at night gets taken away by the ants the next day so that you know you reduce cleaning. Um, swimming pools are left in their raw cement or concrete um, um, states and, and the vital thing I find is just to have you know at the escutcheons and pool fittings done in brass because they age a lot better in yeah, underwater and, and also the um, the, the formwork that I use for my pools, avoiding you know, the need for tiles and stuff, also end up as a decent alternative to the ubiquitous stainless steel pool ladder, which feels so artificial anyway. In, in the board form pool, I use scrap plywood actually for the, for the walls, and that's how it turns out, you know, kind of an easy way of climbing out of the pool. Um, it goes back also down to the way I... I, I I kind of got tired after a while of seeing all the taps that I was specifying sounding like spaghetti or zucchini and, and coming from, from Italy. And so I started getting my plumber to, to make the, um, my own taps and stuff and th they're made of brass and copper and usually this is what you, they do anyway, it's just stuck inside the wall. So I just got them to do the same thing outside the wall so they didn't have to raise any costs. So that's all that, you know, hot water, cold water and a diverter to get the shower going. Um, and also the, the traps uh, are just done in brass with the chrome, uh, bought with the chrome already uh, made, fabricated without the chroming on them so that they age a lot better. And even bottle traps, I've, I started designing them myself so that, you know, that, that can be unscrewed. So in case your rings or your wedding ring fall in there and you need to take, well, you don't, some of you might not want to take the wedding ring out. But, um, and, and the toilets themselves don't get put on, uh, don't get laid over the finishes and tiles because if there's not a whole lot of wet going on anyway and it really wet just happens around in one area, there's no reason why that needs uh, a finish. And um, using cement and, and, and just the, the kinds of materials that you would be doing anyway if you were plastering it helps reduce a whole layer of new materials coming into the, the uh, bathroom. And in, in, in some case, cases, um, the, the, the public area for, for a, 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 um, a, an office building I did, a warehouse, the toilet just, the urinal just becomes a piece of glass laid in front of a, the proverbial pissing on a wall, you know. The, the, ba the basin is just characterized as kind of an, an altar for the cleansing of sin. This, this was for um, an, a, a, a warehouse for, for the rag trade, you know, fashion and all that, you know, the excesses of the fashion world. And, and uh, sometimes uh, skirtings are just left as an unpainted part of the brick to uh, hide the boot scuff or the... Or the in, in my more recent projects, I've even, I've, I've even uh, avoided um, finishing my steel columns with paint. Instead, I, I just get them sanded down minimally and, and a coat of lacquer applied over so that the manufacturer's stamps become that kind of, you know, fabrication artwork of the 
of the, uh, of the column itself. And, and renovations, when they do happen, uh, there's this thing I call archival concrete, where cement is just removed, and, and the concrete that's, uh, that's originally there is just left as that trace of uh, human workmanship, and, and you know, lines separating what's new from what's old are just left as gaps. Uh, mistakes in, 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 in my projects, where they are bound to happen, in, in most projects are just cleaned up a little bit and not really you know, made completely perfect, but left as a trace of that construction biography, uh, as is with um, uh, 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 window lintels and window sills. And um, walls are um, well, almost as badly finished as ceilings, but you know, with a bit of paint, some, the, the contrast isn't so bad. Um, the, the, the dog concrete, the stuff I call really badly formed concrete, is just contrasted against clean glass and aluminum um, um, frames. And, and in larger projects, you know, the bruises, the bruises and, and the, 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 the signs of, 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 its, of its building, this, it's crazy sometimes that we want buildings to look perfect after 20 years. It's like looking at, you know, trying to, be, trying to look like a 16-year-old when you're 60, you know, with all this plastic surgery and stuff. It's ridiculous that a building can't age nice, well, like human beings. And I don't see why our buildings can't be as human, as human and humane as the as the people that inhabit them. Um, and paint is a wonderful thing. I find that a bit of paint goes a long way in terms of skirtings in this way, to uh, so that the same material from the floor goes up to the column, uh, uh, leaving it uh, unpainted. Uh, uh, stair threads with a bit of paint and bathrooms left in that state kind of like do that. In this project, um, for a contractor's office, the, the floor had been made in cement and it had, it had hardened but hadn't chemically set. And, and then the cleaners walked right in and, and they left a whole trail of these boot marks all the way from outside in. And the client was, was insane with anger and he said, we've got to remove that whole thing and you know, this is not going to work. And he called me and I went over there and he said, what, you know, why do you want to do that? These are amazing. You're a contractor's office. These are blue collar flowers. And he went, yeah, you know, you're right. So the, the project was, was, was left that way. It was great. And the very next project I did, I, I waited till the, the floor had hardened, but before it chemically set and I called the cleaners. So they came in and they tracked all these boot marks all the way through the house. And, and the clients kind of loved them this time because I I'd found them before and they, they knew it was planned. So it was okay then, you see. So that's the, that's the, um, uh, the garden shell house. And, and in this project, uh, having to do with, once again, accommodation, you know, the two walls of this building varied from top to bottom by about an inch and a half. And it would have been impossible to finish it without having some kind of a detail to accommodate uh, 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 threads that went across the entire width. So what I've realized was I needed to separate and leave a gap. So the gap varies from an inch and a half to uh, a half an inch. But you don't see that, that variance because of the gap. You know, light kind of like uh, uh, accommodates that. that and, and what the stair does is it gets hung off of, of uh, pins that are half an inch uh, in diameter. And, and the, the riser serves as a beam for the whole thread, uh, for the whole stair, so that light spills into the space, which is an important part of the house because it's the main entry going up to the living room. And, and the, the detail solves the problem, which would otherwise require a hell of a lot of finish to make look right, the whole act of accommodation here. Um, and accommodation also has to do with that element of, of not just what's inside, but what's outside as well. In the threshold house, you know, the back lanes of these old tenements have got this wild line of uh, service entrails running all the way from front to back along the, uh, the backs, uh, back elevations of the tenements. And what I, I did of the threshold house is I didn't want to hide that. I didn't try to put it inside some fancy uh, uh, stainless steel tube. I just, I just hung it, you know. It's kind of a gracious way of, of le letting the service entrails express themselves. <laughs> um, the last topic having to do with farm, am I behind? Am I on time? Am I okay? The last uh, issue having to do with farm and content, I'll be running through a whole series of different projects. It's a bit difficult to explain, but form having to do with the fact that, that the Renaissance in, in Italy itself came from a, a, a worship, an iconization of ancient Rome. Because, you know, the Italians went, no, we need something really cool. We can't go forward, we can't go this way. Let's go back in time. So the Romans served as that means for, you know, uh, legitimizing what they're doing. And, and that gave birth to uh, Italian Baroque, and the Italian Baroque itself gave birth to neoclassicism in the United States. And every time, you know, there's this iconization of what's happening. Right now, we're iconizing the age of um, 
of um, modernity, or is it yeah, the modern movement? And, and it's hard to explain how that leads to that missing piece of the puzzle, but I'll try to do so by means of some examples which follow. Uh, the, the one first example has to do with the fact that you know, you see this in all these wonderful fashion magazines from Italy and France where, you know, you've got this line of tapware and it's just so lovely, you know, but, you know, don't you hate it? You're in this hotel, you're not so familiar with it, and you turn it, and it's like on you and you're like, what the hell? You know, you just get, because it all lines up right underneath that silly spout, right? And then you got to like, really, you know, and then, and then you're okay, right? So what I try to do is I stick my, my tapware on the side, so that, you know, you're, you're there and you just flip it on, you just, okay, it's, it's the right temperature, and then you step in. And when you're done, you just step right back out. So that the whole act of rethinking why something needs to be done a certain way is what content, is about the narrative of content. Another example is, um, you know, I, I, I used to cook a lot, not so much anymore, and I designed the onion valet as a means of finding that lost onion. It, it's happened to me three times before, that one onion in the corner, the forgotten onion, and then the, the kitchen starts stinking like, a, like, like someone just died. And it's like, what the hell? You know, you look, and then suddenly it's like, oh, sh and you're pulling it out, and it's drippy. And so what the Onion Valley does, it just rolls everything right to the middle, and you, you know, you just search right down the middle, and you don't have to worry about that. Um, the Garden Wall Offices, it also applies at slightly larger scales. The Garden Wall Offices was a response to the fact that, you know, a lot of high-rise buildings look the same on all four sides. Or maybe they've got six sides, and look the same on all six sides. And the Garden Wall Offices were, was a project that sat along the edge of a highway, a major artery. It had a lovely hill on one side and a, and a, and a highway on the other. And so the question is, you know, I, I tried to break up the mass by making it a bit softer on this side so that more uh, offices had views to the, to the green. But the highway, you know, what is an elevation for the highway? And I thought, wouldn't it be great if it's an elevation you could project advertising on and also serve as the means for the pollution of the highway to meet the pollution of the building. So the elevation ended up looking like that. It's a, it's a gap, actually. The elevation actually sits behind, a bit sneakily, behind this uh, big uh, wall. The, the larger openings uh, uh, um, um, reference toilets behind, so they get a little bit more ventilation. And, and the, 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 the space is a five meter gap, about a 16 foot gap of a, what I call a vertical neighborhood. And that vertical neighborhood essentially allows sunlight into the, the um, areas of the office where the toilets and all that stuff are placed, you know, the smells, the pollution of the, the, the aircon compressors, all that noise is located right back there. The morning cigarette breaks, you know, coffee breaks. But, and, um, and that's the view out when you, so that the, the visit to the, the trip to the toilet in the morning becomes a more pleasant one rather than something that's, you know, got four walls and a tiny bit of wind, windows that, and, and it's also a place where, you know, I was inspired a bit by these movies where in, in these uh, tenements in, in, in high-rise buildings, say in Hong Kong, you know, you got these guys looking at balconies and there's that cute girl that comes out or the cute guy that comes out at 8.30 every morning. And you always make sure you're out there because you want to, you know, check them out or say hi. And so the vertical neighborhood is that place in the high-rise building where that kind of activity can happen, where you borrow sugar across, where you basically meet another office vertically rather than just meet your neighbors on that trip to your, back to your car, back from your car. And, and the only thing you say to them is uh, ninth floor, please. And then, yeah, yeah okay. You know, so that vertical neighborhood is a place where all that pollution, fence chat, neighborhood gossip, uh, and, 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 and pollution happens. It's a view looking down, and uh, circula vertical uh, ventilation also happens through that, so that heat gain is reduced to a later part of the morning. Toilets. The Cebu Pavilion is, um, we had a great lecture yesterday. I don't know if you guys were around by, by uh, um, Shahid, uh, Shahid uh, Abdullah. And he, did a, his, he said his favorite project was his toilet. And I was just going, wow, you know, I felt a real connection there. The Cebu Pavilion was basically a, a commission by the Cebu Municipality of uh, West East Malaysia for a commission having to do with a garden pavilion for the 2006 Malaysian Garden Festival. And these clients, uh, despite the fact that they, they were, they, they, they're from a transit, a transit town, they, they basically deal with logs and, and timber, you know. And you would think that, you know, being a bit backwards, it would, but they were really enlightened. They wanted not a, one of those fancy, cool, frou-frou type pavilions for their, uh, for their garden festival. They wanted a public toilet. So, so I gave them the world's first public toilet. I gave them, um, oh wait, before that, when I started thinking about the problem, I realized that there's a problem with the toilet. And I, I realized that the reason 
it doesn't matter where in the world you are, toilets all look kind of the same because they all have three blank walls, usually with a band of like maybe windows above which don't really get rid of smells very well, and only one wall with a door in it. And it doesn't matter how fancy they are, how cool they are, they just look all the same. And that's, you go, that's a public toilet, you know? And unless you're really going to hide it behind food or, or get really perverse, you, you're not going to really get a, a toilet that does something that, that changes the whole paradigm of what a public toilet could be. So I gave them the world's first global toilet. I gave them a bush. <laughs> but, but of course, you... <laughs> But of course, you can't, you can't just do a bush. I mean, there are certain, you know, sensibilities you've got to... Um... So, okay, the, the site lay on the edge of, a, of, a, of, of the lake, you know, which was the namesake for the lake gardens, under the shade of a beautiful tambusu tree. And, you know, like I said, it would have been ridiculous to have just stuck one bush there, you know. Um, so I stuck 126 uh, bushes to create a, a kind of a... Um, yeah... A precinct. <laughs> I, you have, of course needed a door, an entrance all the way in, but of course you can't leave that door open, so I had to stick a, a, a modesty screen in front of it. And, and the modesty screen looks a little bland, so you've got to give it a couple of eyes and a bit of a face. And of course, through the eyes, you, you will still, you'll still see the bush behind. And um, that's the site right there, the Lake Gardens, the big tambusu tree right there. That's the site which we're going to zoom into right now. That's the... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the toilet, what, the tambusu tree right there. We've got the, 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 the bush, which is uh, kind of like characterized in the in way of a maze with a squatting pan toilet right in the middle. We had two decks. One was a tea deck and a lazy afternoon Sunday deck facing the lake that was facing um, south. And um, squatting pan toilet. And, um, and of course, the uh, modesty screen, the uh, compost wall. And let me take you through that. that that's the, um, the modesty screen right there. It's about uh, 11, uh, 11 feet high. And you walk behind it to, uh, or on the side of the side to get to the lazy afternoon deck or the tea deck. And you walk between the uh, modesty screen. And Oh, sorry. Details were designed so that um, everything was lifted off the grass so that, you know, garden festivals are nasty things sometimes. After the course of a week, all that lawn is dead, you know. So I wanted to kill as little of it as possible. So most of it was elevated off the ground so that it left uh, um, a little, little bit of a footprint and sunlight was still allowed to drip through. Um, you access the toilet uh, right behind the, the uh, modesty wall through the door, which you could, you know, cinch. Sure, someone could push their way through the bush, but if that door was locked, you know, you'd be a bit of a, uh, a cad. Uh, you walked through the maze under the tabusu tree and you came to the heart of the toilet, which was a squatting pan toilet, uh, a bucket with some water and toilet paper in case one person actually used it. It was quite wild for a long call. And um, on your way out, you came out and you were faced with the two basins that were just cut holes in the, for the eyes of the, of, the, uh, of the toilet itself. The water drips through and just waters the grass underneath. Halfway through the design project, I, I felt that it was a bit stark, the, the modesty wall. So what I did was I seeded the, the, the second uh, uh, frame with uh, wheat germ. And over the course of the week, the wheat germ began to sprout. And it started to grow and grow. And at the end of the week, it was this really thick green eyebrow. And, and then most of the grass didn't die at the end of the week, too. And, and the basins began to, um, to adopt that, that shape that most basins look like half the time. But the whole toilet had little to do with the, the fact that there was a pun on a bush. I mean, that's just kind of silly, right? In fact, you could have taken out the lake, you could have taken out the toilet itself, and stuck almost anything you wanted. But the toilet didn't have to be any particular shape. The whole idea of the, of the, of the, um, of the toilet had to do with its, its modesty screen, the, the compost wall, as a, as a means of identifying the fact that in parks, you usually have two different types of... Um, activities going on. What happens is all those dead leaves and, you know, park detritus, the, 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 the branches that fall, get gathered in, 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 um, in um, wheelbarrows. They get dumped on the side in, in some uh, uh, collected area, and then they get bagged. The bags get thrown into these trucks, and the trucks get driven out like 20 kilometers out of town. And it just seemed ridiculous to be doing that to something that can be pretty nice otherwise. So the whole project recognized that instead of that division, 
that that division could happen, getting rid of that really wasteful bit. And that whole act could be put together to the act of composting, so that, that, that the compost wall was a means of um, collecting you know, park garbage instead of 20 cents for the use of the toilet. Um, the wind filter house is something that I'll be presenting when I get back to Malaysia. It, it, was, it began as a, um, a low-cost house designed for a client's driver um, who couldn't afford, who actually it was pretty wild that you know, a driver, a, a chauffeur, could recognize architecture as a necessity. That kind of boggled me, and it put a whole new emphasis on what an architect's responsibility was. So I designed this house, but in, in, in the, over the last five years, it's just not been built because the, the driver's not been able to uh, negotiate with a relative because he's too poor to afford a piece of land. So to, to have um, a kind of a, a side garden left over for, for this house. So he's still negotiating. In the meantime, I, I've, been, um, I've managed to push through this other very influential client with the Ministry of Housing as a means of maybe making this a, a, a unit. Now, the trouble with low-cost housing in, in Malaysia and really around the world is it's ruled, hard ruled by regulations and requirements. You need that much uh, um, 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 area by vent for ventilation. You need that much area for a bedroom. And what happens is when you put all those requirements together, you end up in, with an absolutely awful unit which has got an absolutely miserable area for where people actually gather, you know? And, and it doesn't matter where you are, uh, Sri Lankan, uh, 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 um, dis post-disaster housing, or, or, or low-cost modules around the world, it's the same thing. The bedroom's almost the same size as the bloody living and dining room. And I thought, what, what would it be fantastic? Because you know what, the, the first thing we talked about, about how you know, food is something we all share. That's the, the only time the family gets together. And you go into your bedroom, the only, time you, 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 the only thing you really do there is you surf on the net, on, on the internet, on things you shouldn't be surfing on anyway, or you fall asleep, right? And so I thought, why wouldn't it be wonderful if the bedrooms just became the size to fit a bed? Nothing else, just a bed. You took all that area out, and you made instead a walk-in wardrobe and a kitchen, which was a decent-sized kitchen. And then you had two toilets. In Malaysia, you need one for men and one for women. And then the rest of that space is given over to that area where the, where the family really gathers. So the bedrooms are made minimal, absolutely miserably minimal. You have a walk-in wardrobe, wow. And you have got a kitchen, which serves a, 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 actual, a space which can actually be used. So that's the wind filter house. Uh, and then. When the, 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 when the occupants have enough money, they can plant trees and the trees become the elevation of the house. And if they have even more money, they can build more walls which allow a decent kind of an entry and a bit more privacy for the uh, living room, dining room, kitchen which opens out to the garden. The elevation of oh, 3D, the elevation of the house um, section of it so that you know, the bedroom area is lifted, so the beds are, are given a bit more grace and dignity from the living dining area. And that area, the loft underneath, it allows for cross ventilation through, as well as through the bedrooms itself. The, the uh, elevations of that, um, I'm thinking of a kind of a, a wire mesh module that the, the local, because this is going to be in a very rural part of Malaysia, that they can be infilled with stuff that they collect from the forest. Instead of you know, having uh, the ministry having to maintain the buildings, the, the structure is all um, 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 prefabricated and designed with galvanized steel to last um, a, a good 20 years and, and, or 30 years. And whatever else uh, it needs maintenance is done by the occupants itself. And so what happens is the, the trees fill in and the elevation becomes you know, a, a part of the forest. And later on, if they, if they have enough money to actually build a roof they can use, uh, you can erect columns and string up netting above to give them a nice tea terrace above. And of course, you need a handrail and they'll stop the kids from falling over and breaking their heads. Um, the last project I'd like to show is the Kvadrat Chaise Long. It was a project for um, two years ago. Kvadrat, they're a, a fabric company based in Denmark. They're the guys that make all that upholstery for those beautiful Danish chairs. You know, the uh, Hans Wegner chairs and the... Uh, the um, um, I'm sorry, I'm running out of, uh... anyway, you know who I'm talking about, the big Danish furniture designers. And they wanted to relaunch this fabric they called an iconic fabric. It was called the Hallingdal 65. And I got this email a year ago, and I, I was looking at it, and I, I saw the word iconic, and I, I, I immediately nearly threw the email out, but I thought I should reply politely saying, you know, I don't design furniture. But halfway through, the word iconic kept on pressing itself on my mind. And I thought, you know, the, the whole commission was to have 
um, uh, the different designers they selected for this relaunch of this fabric at the Salon de Mobile designed a piece of furniture which would incorporate this fabric in some manner or fashion on this piece of furniture. And the trouble with, with, with fabric is it always ends up looking like the furniture it's stuck on. It doesn't really tell its own story as a fabric. And I thought, okay, it's an iconic fabric. It's probably dying under the weight of its having to perform. And, and, and um, it's going to look like another piece of furniture that it's going to sit on. Why don't I design something which is based on how Malaysian traders do sell the fabrics and, and, and that takes on the shape of the fabric itself. So I started looking at, you know, th that's, yeah, that's um, Carklin and, oh, sorry. Well, never mind the names. Let's move on to, you see, ubiquitous fabric, uh, sorry, iconic fabric, the fabric that really sells well, sells so well, the rolls end up being really small. And what happens with these really small rolls is they're not rolled out anymore because they don't have the weight to carry that momentum, right? What local traders in Malaysia do is they hold a loose end and they toss the light end in the air a little bit so that you get to see what the fabric looks like before it settles. And I thought, what if, conjecturally, you could take a photograph of that fabric in mid-air as it's unfurling and the shape of that fabric became this curl of, of this chair which became a chaise long, right? So that's how that whole design came about. And, and the kicker came about, and it was a joke at the time, and it kind of backfired in a way, I'll tell you why. That, you know, an iconic fabric having to bear the burden, the gravity of its success, should be by right heavy itself. So I wanted them to be hauling this, this really heavy piece of furniture all around the world, because that's where it's going to be exhibited, as a kind of a black joke. So in order to create that form, I needed sheet steel that was six millimeters thick. This thing weighs 136 kilograms, so it requires at least five people to carry. The chair got made, and um, if I knew how difficult it would be to make a comfortable chair, I would never have taken the proposition at all, on at all, because the, the one most important thing above all else was that it had to be absolutely comfortable to make all its other failings secondary and to hide the fact of its you know, black joke as, a, as an icon. But anyway, it got built, and um, there was a little bit of padding to make it a bit more comfortable, hence the little chamfer on the sides. There were steel feet to hold it off the ground, and it got exhibited in the Salon Milan, and it's traveling the world right now, I think, 136 kilograms of, uh, of, um, of uh, iconic weight. But the problem is, you know, it's not costing the world any less to do this. And, and by right, I should have just not taken on the commission, because, um, yeah, ha having a joke at the world's expense isn't exactly a, a great thing to, to do. I'd like to end my lecture with a small parable, a bit of a story in a way, about uh, that I call the seashell and the sea, and I hope you'll be able to get something out of it. There were two architects, two different architects, who were asked to do different phases of the same aquarium. And the first architect took inspiration from the uh, multi-chamber Nautilus seashell. It's, uh, it's a shell that's um, since you know, become extinct. And he found that, you know, it's from the sea and all that, you know, aquarium, seashell, you know. And he found upon dissecting it that it was based on this wonderful thing called the Fibonacci series, which gave rise to a series of, um, of uh, concentric shell shells that slowly decreased in this wonderful mathematical order, which allowed for circulation on the outside wing, leading you around amazing tanks of different shapes and sizes and exhibits, all the way around to the center, where the most powerful parts of your aquarium, and then you recirculated out on the inside, thereby separating circulation. It was a wonderful building. It circulated beautifully, had fantastic spaces, and it was amazing to look at. And it looked a little bit like a seashell. The second architect took inspiration from the sea, and he asked the question, what? He didn't ask the question what the aquarium should look like. He asked the question what the sea was. And he found out upon researching the sea, that was about high tides, it was about low tides. He found out it was about the most luminous shallows of the, Mar of the Maldives, and the darkest shadows of the Mariana Trench. He found us about the most delicate ecosystems known to man and about the most powerful waves and currents on Earth. He found us about sunrises, sunsets, and about the food chain. And this aquarium became something beyond a single name. It, it, it opened before the sun rose so that people could understand what a sunrise on water meant. It closed after sunset. It had tanks so shallow you could walk in them to understand what it meant to have fish nibbling at your feet. It had tanks so deep, you had to take an elevator 150 feet down to understand what pressure really meant. And I find that 
Everything in design today is predicated on having begun one of two ways. You can either begin with form, or you can begin with content. And I find that whenever I'm stuck with design, whenever I'm looking at a book, whenever someone tells me that's ugly, and someone else tells me that's good. You know, you students, you've got this experience quite often, right? You're working on a scheme, you love it. Your professor, your main guy comes along and says, shit, that's great, man. Now you just make this little change here, you make that little change there, you're going to get an A, right? And then this other guy comes along, who is like the dean of the school or someone more important than your professor. He looks at it, he goes, this is crap, you're going to fail, right? I hate that. My whole life to school, that's what happened, right? And, you know, not knowing what is right and what is wrong is killing. When you look at a book, how do you know that if that book is telling you bullshit or if it's telling you the truth? I found out that there are just two questions you need to ask yourself. Is it more to do with content or is it more to do with form? Is it predicated on a seashell or, or pebbles by the Pearl River Delta or, or, or a bird's nest, you know? What do bird's nests have to do with spectating an Olympic sport? I have no clue. But, you know, that sometimes the most, the most talented architects design the most awful buildings. It's not an indictment of how bad that architect is. It's just an, an honest appraisal of the fact that architects are only human. We all make mistakes. The only thing we do to begin to make good on those mistakes is to ask ourselves, are we designing our expressions of architecture with the beginnings of content, or are we doing it with the beginnings of form? Because if you're beginning with a form, you will only end up imitating that form in one way or another, or dis design disc jockeying it. But if you start with content, you'll arrive with, with things, I think, that go way beyond a single name. And that's what I try to think about when I think of, uh, of the work I do, which, which is about small projects, less about you know, radical ideas and more about, hopefully, radical questions. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, IAP for, for inviting me here. Um, and, and really, especially all of you for attending the uh, talk today. Thank you very, very, very much.